Let the show begin. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Unusually hot, yes, but it's better than snow and ice, I think. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to talk on annuals. There is a handout. And what that has, the, the general organization of that is at the top are the 2022 winners, which were just released this year. Underneath that, in dark, I have what looks like the best winners that are going to come out next year for 2024. So that's just so far with two evaluations. And then the rest of it is organized alphabetically of the plants that have been winners from 2006 to 2022. And the first ones in there are usually the older ones. A lot of those have been improved. And then the last ones I add on each year as they go by. And I, I happen to put my favorites in there. I underlined them with yellow because I cheated. But uh, you don't have to listen to me because the extension wants us to be very impartial. But I am very partial to those. So there we go. Anyway, so that's most of it. I'm not following that as an outline. What I hope to do is give you a little of the history information about annuals. We'll start with the big pots here, then move to the east side and come on around. So hopefully you can get under that tent a little bit also. History of the Idea Garden trial system. We've run this now for 22 years. We started out with proven winners because we had a buddy that started working for the company and we got three plants. That was awesome. Well, as the company grew and the company is all about marketing, the major thing they want to know is, would you buy it at the end of the year? So I now have a column when I submit it is, would you buy it and why? Uh, we now get a certain amount of plants every year, usually about 48. Half of them are new and will be introduced the next year. And I'll try to remember to point out some of those. And the other half are old for comparison or they want to push it on the public. That was a little side hint. So we, we have new and old caliber koa here, for instance, and so we'll try to compare those. Uh, what else? Oh, we used to get things from Ball Horticultural, Pan Am. That was awesome because we got proven winners and ball. And then when I first started this with Sandy Mason in 2001, I called up every company I could think of, and they're all like, no, no, no. But there are other great companies like Syngenta, Danzinger, um, just a whole bunch of Suntory, Cicada, all of those can have great plants. If you want uh, to look at trials for other areas, Penn State has, you know, lots of different things. They have an online thing and evaluations, also Michigan State. And I go and see our very same plants at Michigan State because we live in Michigan now. So those are good backup references. We're only going to show you the proven winner ones here. Uh, what else? I have to thank our wonderful trials team and the greenhouse people because they're the ones that help grow it, get it out here, and plant it. So they're wonderful. Uh, proven winners, most of their products are hybrids, and they are all vegetatively produced. So we get a little thumb-sized plant, grow it in the greenhouse uh, till they're appropriate size, and put them in here. They are not cheap now. They used to be a lot less expensive, but... Sunrise Nursery, boy, I love that place because you can get a proven winter annual for about $3, whereas the cost of everything has gone up for people, the staff to tend them and grow the plants. So the proven winter plants at many other stores are anywhere from $6 to $8 each. And if you're going to put in a bunch, that's a lot of money. So we're very, very grateful for the proven winter company uh, for allowing us to trial these. There used to be 47 trial gardens in Canada plus the US. They've now shrunk that to 40 and that's it. We're the only volunteer, we're the only master gardener people allowed to do that. It's a huge privilege in my mind. And that is because we write these detailed evaluations. We come in and evaluate things once a month for four months, average all the scores, look at the percentage of bloom, write comments on it, and I make this giant Excel form that if you ever want that at the end of the year, just email me and send in an email or uh, how everything did to the company with an Excel. And from that, we pick the very top winners. There's uh, a rating of one to five that we did yesterday for our July trials. One is it's a miserable plant or a lot died. Three is it's a nice average plant and it's worth considering planting. 
Four is, oh my, this is a good plant. Five is, I've got to buy it next year. This is just the best. So, and then after everything's averaged, uh, we select metal winners, gold, silver, and bronze. Most of what's on your handout are the gold winners. So the top of the top, and that's really hard to get because if you're going to average around a four and a half to a five for four months, that's a great plant. So things that are bred for spring blooming, like Nemesia and Osteospermum, as beautiful as they are, they melt out in this hot weather. So do I. But, but they're good plants if you want a spring bouquet, but they may not be prolific in blooming July and August. Um, what else? I see what else you need to say. Oh, proven winners takes at least eight years before this plant gets to us. And we trial them out the year before they're released. So they have pictures where they'll have thousands of plants and they'll pick two and everything else gets mulched under, <laughs> even though they look good. So this has a long uh, history behind it for trialing it. This particular one is Calibrecoa Superbells. They call all of theirs Calibrecoa Superbells pink. And it's an improvement over their past ones. So it may not all be completely new, but they may just have one that they had out before. The breeders have been tinkering with them and selecting the very best plant. And then they release it as an improved form. Now, let's see. What was new in 2022? We got these giant pots. We have 11 of them. There is some upkeep to them. But normally in containers, it's horrendous to try to keep them watered every day. These have an inside um, space where we put water into. We're fiddling with the last two. There's some problems with the drainage of those. So I, yesterday when we rated plants, I did not count these plants down because they can't help it. It's really wet soil. So we're going to try to fix that. But most of the time, the giant containers show well. There's so many plants now that are bred for containers. And the reason I plant the Calibrecoa here and also in the ground is so you can see how terrible they do in the ground. That hasn't been true last year than this year. Either we have the best trials team ever, or I think Calibrico have truly improved in their ability to tolerate an in-ground planting. Most of the time, Calibrico are big pouters. We have a hard time getting them out of the greenhouse. They detest overly moist soil. So they just die in the greenhouse. Or they can't stand alkaline conditions such as alkaline soil. We have that here. Alkaline water. We have that here. So even in the greenhouse, they have to correct for alkalinity. And that's why they do better with a potting mix in a container, free drainage, and they, they do better. They do need more fertilization than some other annuals. But what has shocked me is the amount that some of the in-ground ones have uh, done so well. We leave in some of the dead plants so you can see Okay, well, a couple of them died. There's another one doing what Calibricos like to do, get sick, uh, rangy, and turn brown and then die. So the double white is not a good in-ground plant. I would recommend all Calibricos be in a container anyway. And we have a couple containers out front with a new plant in. I'll tell you about James Britannia. Um, but here, it's just great. So the new ones back there and also in the ground, is a, is a double rosette. It's a light pink and a dark pink called smitten pink. We are smitten. This is great caliber color. So you can see it crowded around with a verbena, which is new for next year also. That is a cashmere pink or pink cashmere verbena. And that has been a lovely plant so far too. Um, we rate things on uh, how many of the blooms are sitting above the plant. That is an improvement of a blue that will be out next year. And that has most of the blossoms above the plant. This does too, but I would probably rate that a little higher. It's got more blooms, more that you see to the eye. This came out this year. We trialed it last year. It's Prism Pink Lemonade. It has four different colors of variations. It's absolutely incredible. And it's, it overflows the, the uh, entire pot. So even though that was out last year, I highly recommend this. The double twilight, the lavender one in the back, has been doing well this year, too. That's been out before. And then the other two I won't worry about so much. There is a Calibrecoa redstone here, 
But what I, because that pot is too wet, I rated it with the gazebo uh, plantings on the south side. So what I tried to do this year particularly is all the trial areas consume an enormous quantities of plants. It's 600 plants or more. So there's a lot of planting that goes on. I try to get them mostly in there. But this year, I made a huge effort to try to get the sections to take the extras, the leftovers. Now, that means there aren't as many plants available for the sale. But that means I get to see them and, and everyone else that trials them gets to see them in other areas. So if someone buys them at sale, takes them home, I don't know if they were good or bad. So it's a good thing we did that because the redstone here, which the pot conditions are making it unfair, it looks great in the gazebo planters over there, or most of it does. So I tried to convince other areas to take them if we have leftovers. That was a sneaky plan. Oh, I was going to mention, we've been trying to find this one petunia, Tierra Pink. And unfortunately, when I printed out the trial things for people, that was on there. Oops. They removed that at the last. We never got that shipped. And it's disappeared from their website. The picture looked really good. I was excited. Another petunia. But Tierra Pink is off the table. And I don't know if they've withdrawn it completely or not. We had another surprise on planting, and that is they sent us uh, a couple of rocking uh, series of salvia, and we were supposed to get half purple and half blue. Planting day, when they finally started blooming, I found out every single one of them was that light blue color. So it, it worked out okay for the design, but we did not get the purple, and I'll show you a purple one a little bit later on. Okay, so... Uh, I've told you about calibercoas. Now they can be real picky and uh, difficult to get out of greenhouses, not just us, but other people too. But they are gorgeous in containers if you fertilize them and keep up with them. Yes? Yeah. Really I'm not going to be able to hear. I got a microphone in one ear. <laughs> I think people still must be buying them. I mean, I think calibercoas are so unpredictable. I, I won't buy them. <laughs> they are, they can be. I think these newer ones, last year and this year, I'm a lot more impressed. Tom loves caliber cores, and I've always thought they're beautiful. Uh, but I had a real chip on my shoulder about them because we only had small pots or we planted them in the ground. I think these, they keep up with it. Now, the other problem that happens when you put a, a plant in a container is you've got to know what the vigor of the plant is, and they don't mark that a lot. Uh, a big petunia, such as bubblegum petunia, their top-selling plant, that has a vigor of four out of four. It is beefy and huge, takes over. If you plant calibercoas with a bubblegum petunia, you're not going to see much of this. So in container planters, you have to get all kind of the same kind of vigor of plants, and they don't mark them a lot of times, so, which is frustrating. Um, what else? Oh, I wanted to tell you that it was kind of fun that we got some of the other theme areas to pick up some of our plants this year, the ones that were left over. And if you walk around there as we go over to the other area, you'll be able to see three of the verbenas we got this year. This one is uh, verbena cherry burst. It's an improved version. What do you notice with that? This same plant. Any difference? Inside and outside. Look at this. It's very different than the old one. The old one was smaller, didn't have as many blooms. It did not produce very well in the summer. The old cherry burst would be asleep by now or gone on vacation and not blooming. This is, which is great. But what we were surprised about is there's a bunch of pink ones in here. A double pink and then this more reddish color in the pinwheels. So that was curious. Uh, but it, we like it. So, okay, go. <laughs> if the new one has got different colors, fine. Initially, I thought we goofed. Our plants were labeled wrong. They were not. And I thought maybe it was the new one, Pink Cashmere. This is spectacular. It's got monster huge blooms. It's going to be out next year. So far, it's been hugely productive the entire season. Now, we'll see what they look like in August. Because as I mentioned, if you go over to the trials over there and see other verbena, go over there the end of August. See what's alive. See what's looking good over at Hartley Gardens, because there'll be all a bunch of verbena with one or two blooms, and then one of them might have quite a few. This one I'm hoping will keep in there for the rest of the season. I don't know. But that will be out next year, and I would love to have that next year. <laughs> this
this is one that has been out, Sparkling Amethyst. And Sparkling Amethyst is delightful. It also has got bigger blooms, and it tends to have more blooms through the season. There was a cousin of it we trialed once that had a reddish color. It was a miserable failure, I think. I don't know if you think that, Patty, but uh, Sparkling Amethyst, two thumbs up. The redder version of it, not, not so good. But if you care to walk around here and, oh, I'm going to mention one more thing. So I, I do have a prejudice for the mini Vista petunias. Now, all of these are calibrecoas. They're gorgeous. And there's a pink calibrecoa. This is just a few mini Vista, new one for next year, sweet sangria. Look at the difference between the mini Vista petunias and the calibrecoa. That's an in ground. So am I going to spend $8 for a caliber card and put it in the ground? No. I'm going to buy one of those. I'm going to spend my $8. So I, I kind of like that, that we happen to have a petunia in there comparing with the others. But we on purpose uh, show them in the ground. Not. This is not a trial plan, but there are several zinnias that are great. The perfusion was a very good uh, version of it. I think the Zahara are better than the perfusion. And this is a zesty series, zesty purple. I think that one is just about as darn good as the Zahara's, and I give it a thumbs up. So, but that we bought. Is that its name, zesty purple? Uh, no, it zesty purple. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I'm sweaty. Goodness, but I I really like that color in there. If you walk around the middle path, you can see some of these verbena. I was talking about. We'll just zip through here to get a little air movement. Uh this is what the pink cashmere looks like in the ground. Oh, I hope that keeps up. It's amazing. What? Yeah, I need a favorite towel. Okay, I'll go get you one. <laughs> a sparkling amethyst over here looking marvelous. And I hope that one keeps up. It might not, but it's looking awfully good for this time. And then, as I mentioned, Here's that new cherry burst that's coming out next year. These are pink and those are kind of a reddish. So it's an interesting combination. I'm going to put my talk a little bit about design. I know you want to hear the best plants, but I put them down. And I will also show you best plants in here. Design. This year was kind of frustrating because we got an enormous number of pink and lavender. And you can't, it's, well, you could, but it's hard to mix those all in. We also got almost all roundy, moundy plants. So how do you design something? Most trial gardens just have uh, triangles or squares, and that's a fair test. But because this is open to the public, we try to make a bit of a design and trial of plants. Uh, so what do you do with all these roundy moundies? Well, we only got a few upright ones. There were some salvia. We didn't get any of those amazing heliopsis. Uh, sun credible sunflower things, which, oh, they're awesome, or the tall coleus this year. We got a uh, kind of roundy boundy coleus, two kinds. But so design is a trick, and I, I borrowed ideas from Michigan State University Trial Garden, and I gave a lecture on that. It's online through Pyatt County, I think. But they had all this Swiss chard there. Well, look, we've got a goldfinch uh, way over there. I don't know. He's just going to attend the lecture. He's so cute. He's on top of the chart in front of the pot. Yeah. Hi, baby. Anyway, I, these big pots, they're all big and beige. I forgot to tell you they have bumps on the side of them. What are the bumps of those pots and these? It's Braille. And it's actually a poem by Robert Frost called Spring Pools. So I, I couldn't read it, but that's what they told me. Anyway, so we have a giant pot over here. And I thought, well... It'd be boring just to see giant pot with a cute little caliber co on the top. How about we get some big leaf, big textured plants in here, and I put chard in. So we grew that from seed in the idea garden, and I think it really gives it a punch. I'm overjoyed by it, actually, and other people are like, God, we have to keep trimming it. Yes, because it's an aggressive plant, but you can't beat having some edibles in your garden. They look great. My mother-in-law got mad. I used to grow rainbow chard, and I didn't eat it, and she would be mad at me. But well, I like it for design. So it covers the pot. It adds a large uh, leaf and a large texture. This is a, but it's not a trial plant. This is a cutie. If you come over here, 
it's a caliber co-op vintage coral and it's got kind of a purple edge to it a little rose in the middle and several tones of corals and pinks so that's a good one to get a close-up one of and on the other side uh i think it's amber double amber that one has been out this will come out next year and i think it's a pretty good plant the other thing that's unusual we did get again we've tried it before are climbing sweet potatoes which are in the back there are seven of the key lime in the middle and two of black coffee on each side. It's called upside, meaning grows up. Now, ball plants, when I visited them many years ago, they have their own climbing potato too called solar tower, same colors. Uh, what we've noticed about this is it crabs around and doesn't want, want to climb anything. You kind of have to help it on there. And the brilliance of our trials team, they have a livestock fence here. What a great idea. We didn't spend a lot of money for that. I'm thrilled with their idea. And you had to kind of put that uh, sweet potato tendrils on it to begin with. And now they've got the idea. The other thing we've noticed is the black one, the black coffee, that climbs taller. I saw it at a friend's house because it's it's been out this year. And she has one on a large trellis in the pot. It really looks neat. But you have to help it out some. Um, so that's upside, key lime, and black coffee. Cute names, a little upright. But they only get about six feet tall. In my experience, about five feet tall or so. So they, they aren't going to go all over. This is a new one for next year. And these sweet potatoes are beautiful plants. This has got that long name, Sweet Caroline, Sweet Heart, Mahogany. And it has, uh, anytime they say sweetheart, it's going to have a rounded leaf, heart-shaped leaf. But what's kind of nice is when the newer uh, leaves that come out, they have some amber on it and some limes. And that's pretty. These in-ground uh, sweet potatoes take up a lot of yardage. And we can't afford to plant with our space here, 12 of them all together. We do use them on the north side. Keep in mind, they do great in shade. How could that be? They're a sun plant. That is truly one that will do sun or shade, and we'll see that when we get to the north side. So that's awesome. These things look magnificent when they trail over a wall or a ledge. So if you have kind of a wall and got some sun or even shade, trail it over that. Oh, they're a spectacular lime and a burgundy together. So that one is mahogany. Uh, one that's been out, it's a mini vista petunia. I would tend to say that any mini Vista Petunia is worth the money. This one is a yellow. It's a big, broad spreader, and it's quite delightful with the yellow uh, ribbed chard. This is uh, Biddens. It's been out before. Campfire Flame. And it's a cute little petite flower. It's, it's quite lovely, but we tried out another Biddens called Goldilocks Rocks, and in spite of that incredible name, it's a really fun name, and it has a bigger bloom, it holds on to all the dead blooms. We find that not as attractive. So that looks scraggly to us, and we're not rating it that high. This we're rating higher, and it's cute and petite. But think about something else. Another plant has been out that we got from Ball years ago. Me, I probably wouldn't pay the high price for that. I would buy Haladium Dakota Gold. It's the same little very fine fringe flower, bright yellow bloomer all season long. If you put it near your driveway, it may reseed and come up next year, even though it's an annual. Bully for that. And even better, so far as I'm concerned, deer, rabbits, don't eat it. I have both and chipmunks too. Ah, I can't grow a lot of things I could grow here in Champaign. So I would say think about Helenium Dakota Gold, although... This Biddens Campfire Flame is a good one. Now, moving on, this will be new next year. It's called a Super Tunia, Petunia Super Tuna, Tunia, Bermuda Beach. It's kind of a pinky coral color, and it has big, flousy blooms, bigger blooms than most. Um, it doesn't grow as thick as the others, but it's showing very well, and we're quite pleased with this so far, too, with a bit of an unusual color. The mini Vista Petunia Scarlet has been out before. Some people have criticized it because they don't see this as a red red. They see it as an orange red. Well, you know, Scarlet. And how many uh, 
blue plants have you seen that are actually purple? The naming doesn't always fit. But scarlet, wow, it took over everything. A new coleus for next year in the back is called a chocolate drop, ch uh, cherry drop, cherry drop. It's cousin chocolate drop with a burgundy, darker burgundy, and a green inside is out now. It's actually over there. But this is cherry drop, and it goes quite well with kind of an orangey pink. Thank you. Um, I happen to be in love with this yellow petunia. Some either got taken, which I think happened, so it's not as full. You know how people were taking annuals. Thank you for doing that. Uh, yellow petunias are one of the hardest to grow. They just, like growing them from seed is a lot more difficult than other petunias. And they're more particular. Uh, they've had other ones out in the past. Honey, which has two to three cone, uh, color variations, a yellow to an amber. And that was a very pretty one. The second year we trialed it, though, it wasn't so good. I don't know why. I'm in love with this. Because if you were to put that, particularly in a container up near you, it's just... You greet it in the morning, it's sunshine. I think it's such a pretty color, two-tone yellow. Um, moving along, this is a repeat of Bermuda Beach, doing very well over here. Uh, the other sweet potato, which will be out next year, Red Hawk. And it's another great sweet potato. I can't say anything bad about it. So that's about this. So design-wise, we've got edibles, we've got yellow, orange, uh, to burgundy colors through here. The next is the south border. And usually I do this in the hot colors, but this year we decided to make it, it's supposed to be purple and white. And that was supposed to be the dark purple salvia, but we didn't get it in, so we had to plant the blue. It looks great. And again, I tried, well, let's try something different. We need height here, so this is kale red boar. Not a trial plant. It made a literal forest. And I kind of like that. It's like, we have trees growing in our yard. Um, but all of these petunias through here are mini vistas. You cannot beat them. They're great. The midnight one is the darkest of them. That came out, well, just this year. We trialed it last year. I like it, but it's so deep, I think it gets lost. You need to put it with a white plant or a red or a yellow to brighten it up. They have a new one, we'll see when we get around the corner, I do like a little bit better, that's a deep purple. Violet Star, incredible plant. This is the mini vista white, and if you notice, those blooms are bigger than the other mini vistas. It's a keeper, that's a real nice plant. The uh, coleus chocolate drop is in the back, and again, those want to be kind of moundy. They'd rather be in a container. We don't have that many containers, so we tried that. And in the back is Salvia Rocking Series. Blue suede shoes. They have three in the Rocking Series. I'll show you those over there when I catch my breath over there. But I think it came out pretty well in spite of those being blue. Oh, I, I can't remember who it was yesterday during our uh, evaluation. I was mentioning there's a lot of caterpillars on here that like it. I hope we're feeding good ones. But it was either Patty or Judy that said, you know, this would blend very well with any lavenders, purple, or pinks. The pink tinge will uh, be pulled out of that if you plant it with pinks. And I thought, that's a great idea. Our master gardeners know a lot. Ah, uh, okay, another red hawk. This is great. This, <laughs> these are begonias here. Aren't they wonderful? We're leading in them. Why are we doing that to show the difference in these plants here versus the shade? Now, they say that the double delight begonias do fine in sun or shade. No, <laughs> no, this is full sun. And, and we got a new one this year. This is a brave little character and it's actually blooming. Uh, that's the blush rose. There's another one called apple blossom, but we'll see those over there. So I'm leaving ugly plants in here on purpose to show the difference. They, they do not need well in sun. Last year, we tried Surefire Begonia. I am in love with those. They get much taller, much bigger. They will take sun pretty well. Better in a container, because that gets better water. Um, but these, no, I wouldn't plant them out here. And I think I'd probably plant them in a container. You'll see why when we get around. So we decided yesterday, we pick our favorite plants every month. 
And doggone it if there are almost always a lot of petunias on that list, particularly in Minna Vistas. This is a top pick for June. This is a top pick for July so far. So bonus point, this is another biddens. It's marshmallow, campfire marshmallow. They like that campfire stuff. The flame was over there. It's a much bigger plant, much better. Beautiful blooms. I hope it keeps up because that's spectacular. It looks good in a container also. So we love that this year. Um, why don't we take a short break? And I'll go. Kale red bore. I'm sorry. That's kale red bore. Grown from seed, from babies to forest. Very nice. Red bore. R-E-D. So lucky. Because we actually have an in-ground watering system here. Talk about lucky. The other places don't really have it. But we did. And, and I... I'm always grateful to Joyce because she helped institute that. The sprinkler heads are in the front and run around the outside. But that makes designing things a little difficult because they will very well water the front. They don't always arch to the back plants as well. And that also affects how I design things. I've got to keep the shorter plants in the front and hope that it gets over it. And our trials team may have to water the back a little bit better too. The first couple of years we were experimenting with it and it soaked the front killed some plants. It was just too much water, but they've got it all figured out now. But that's another reason I plant the petunias in front. Petunias will take more water than other plants. They won't think out. Oh, you know what? I forgot something important. <laughs> Spraying sweat. Over here, uh, I also design things that if I think it's going to die or look ugly, I might put that in the back or off to the side and put petunias in front of it to cover it. So I thought that this James Britannia, i got to tell you about James Britannia. I'll bring it over to you. <laughs> James Britannia, this is Safari Dusk. And they have had three of them out. We tried them out a couple years ago. The other name is South African Phlox. As I told you, the breeders go all over the world to find nifty stuff. This is nifty. So this is the better one. This will be out next year, Safari Dusk. They have a twilight. I'm going to step in here for a sec. And they also have a sky. The sky is not as big a bloomer, a large size bloom as this one is. And it also tends to get eaten by other plants more easily. It got buried under the kale red bar over there. But um, I've changed my mind on this. When we grew it two years ago, all, almost all of it died. It looked just miserable. These guys, when we got them in from the company, half of them died in the greenhouse. They don't like overwatering. Greenhouse people, they come, not us, not our team. They water everything, soak it every day. These guys hate it. Caliber Coa hate it. So they're now saying, well, we should plant these in containers. And I didn't have enough room. I planted a couple in the front. And the safari dusk is doing better. The sky is getting eaten in the front pot, but this is a good plant. And I, and I might recommend it this year before I hated it. Um, so I was surprised about that. All right, the James Britannia story. I call him James. <laughs> uh, South African flocks. All right, so this is the big show piece, the west side. And the front is all these incredible petunias. The new one, as we had over there, is sweet sangria. And it looks a lot like the middle plant up there, which is a Vista jazzberry. Vista jazzberry, big winner for several years. And I'm going to show you a close-up of the blossoms in a little bit. Tom said he thinks he'd rather plant this one than the Vista uh, jazzberry. They're both incredible. Vista uh, petunias are big boys. They grow up bigger of four, usually. They grow up and out, and they will literally become a tidal wave of color. And so that's great. These are smaller, smaller in size, better in uh, containers. They have floods of color across the front. We also, as I mentioned, rate things on percentage of bloom from 1 to 4. If it's blooming from 1 to 25%, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, or 75 to 100% bloom. It's a four. All of these petunias across the front are blooming 
with a four. Huge amount of bloom coverage. Sweet Sangria, multi-award winner, uh, Petunia Hot, or Mini Vista Hot Pink, which Tom wanted to nickname Baby Bubblegum, like the, the Vista. I like that. We have two uh, kind of violet to purple ones. This one will be out next year. I'm going to show you a close-up in a bit. This is Mini Vista Ultramarine. I think it has a much richer color than the Midnight over there. I think it stands out more. It's still pretty sultry and recedes, but it's a good plant. In the middle is a new one for next year that I'm also in love with, a Piketty. It's called Hoopla Vivid Orchid, and it is all of that. I would hoopla over that one. A lot of the Piketty's that they brought out with a different colored edge have not been very vigorous. The pretty much Picasso, Picasso and Bloom, Blue, there's one over, I think, in Serenity. You can barely see the colored green edge. This one's a standout so far. The next of Petunias is Mini Vista Pink Star. Been out for years. We love it. Followed by the Sangria again. And we've already seen the Verbena before. Look at the Verbena uh, sparkling amethyst. It is just solid color. Blooms all over the top. Now, the uh, pink um, cashmere is doing pretty well here, too. There's a little variability in that from where it's at. And then in the middle of Vista series are those big guys. So that's Vista Jazzberry, a multi-award winner. Okay, I'm going to get the closer. Oh, in the very back is Terenia, Catalina Pink, and we will see that in the north side, too. I'm disappointed with it. Oh, okay, we're going to... Right what? The Autumn Crisp. Autumn Crisp, yes. We leave dead stuff in so I can see it and take pictures. Uh, I'll tell you about the scavola in a little bit, but these are different petunias. They, this was the uh, saffron finch. It's a regular supertunia. Here's the hoopla. Hoopla! Vivid orchid. Very nice plant. And interestingly enough, this is the jazzberry, Vista jazzberry. I'm going to hold on to that. And I'm also going to hold on to one of their older plants, which is this one. This is uh, Petunia Royal Velvet. And this has been my go-to plant for years for having a really nice purple color. But if you notice, I'm going to pull out the mini vistas. <laughs> the mini vista uh, sweet saffron compared to the jazzberry, they're almost the same size. The difference is their height and their width on that. So that's those. This was the uh, really dark one, Midnight, and it's darker than Royal Velvet. And then the newer one, Ultramarine, it's very much like the Royal Velvet. Last year when we were trialing the Midnight, I said, ah, geez, that's awfully dark. I wish they would get a mini royal velvet. They did. It's right there, ultramarine. So I, I like that comparison. Scabola, I'm going to tell you a stupid story because maybe you'll retain it. They're also known as fan flower. They have upside down five, five fingers. But actually Linnaeus, uh, the well-known botanist, decided to name it in the 1700s. And he called it Scabola because there was a Roman hero that was such a great fighter that everybody loved him. And just to prove when he got captured how tough he was, he put his right hand on the fire. So he only could use a left hand. And scavola in Latin means left hand. That's a gross story. No, wake you up. I'd rather call it fan flower. But uh, anyway, poor, poor scavola. All of his descendants were called scavola after that, meaning left hand. Poor baby. But he was brave. Anyway, we have three of these. They're all improved. Pink, white, and blue. Someone pointed out yesterday that the blue, even though these are all covered in, with blooms, the blue seem to have more green in the center, less of the flowers showing. They were very slow in taking off this year. That will probably ding them when we make our comprehensive averages at the end of the year. But like Roman gladiators, they are made for hot conditions. They can take the heat. They have had them in big planters over at the university just trailing out of these massive concrete planters, and they take it very well. 
We did have some die here recently, though. That's always sad. Um, but mostly they're doing pretty well now, and Scavola in general is a good plant. So we'll see how it does the rest of the season. And now I'm going to talk about the, the salvia. We got several kinds of salvia this year. And as you know, there's the wonderful salvia Victoria Blue. Um, an improvement of that is something that we did not try, but I've tried it a lot. And it's called, it's out, out of the front border, salvia misty. This is wilted, but it has pleated leaves. And it's a bigger, tougher plant than Salvia Victoria. But then there, you know, you've seen the black and blue. No, I'll probably mangle this name. Garantica. No, what? How do I say it, Joe? Salvia. Say, say the, the Latin name. Garanitica. Garanitica. Oh, that's a terrible name. It comes from the name of Garan, which is Brazil, where the black and blue Salvia was bred. The newer ones are called the Rocking Series, and there's three kinds. There is the blue, which you see here, a bigger, whiter plant, looser form. They, they are not flooded with blooms like this, but these are doing pretty well. What we were supposed to get was half of the beautiful purple. I really like the intensity of that color. This is called Rockin' Deep Purple, and the blue was called Rockin' Blue Suede Shoes. Very tricky, very cute. And the third kind of the Rockin' series is this one, uh, Rock and Fuchsia. And it, it's kind of nifty because the stems keep a darker color and then the fresh blooms, the hummingbirds love the fuchsia. So that's a good one. But um, there's so many varieties of salvia from short to tall. This blue has a more open version. I think the purple last year bloomed better for us, had more blooms, uh, but it, it still is never going to cover it like this. But keep it around for your hummingbirds and your pollinators because they do like those. Hmm. Yes, they they happen to this year. Uh, yeah, I mean they're not really meant for part shade, but we do get a lot of shade coming in in the afternoon here, and we had to get them in the back of the border somewhere. Okay, last thing should be short, and I hope not too long. Okay, last bit here, and then we can all take a break and get in the shade. Uh, this is the shady side. So, but the sweet potatoes look really nice in here. This is the upside key lime, and it's growing around these really cheap little uh, six rib plastic spheres. And what I almost did is get up early and cut out black sunglasses and put them around there and slip one in there and call it Cousin It. I was tempted to do that, but I was tired at 4 a.m. Uh, so, sweet potatoes can lighten up the shade, it's a good place to put them. This is the Terenia. It's doing better here than over there. I personally never have very good success with Terenia. I seem to get it yellowed and it limps along and dies. And this is an average plant. Um, it's not going to win awards so far. Some of the front of it is yellow. It's blooming. That's good. But it's an average plant, probably a three. But here are those begonias. Now, they're sure looking a lot better here than over at the full sun. This is Double Delight Apple Blossom, and that's incredible. The other thing to note is these tend to have uh, drooping blossoms. The blossoms are so heavy that they arch. This would be fantastic in a container, hanging container. You'd go right by it, or in a big container where you can droop over the edges. So Apple Blossom is the one that will be new out next year. Don't plant it in the sun, um, or if it is, a container in the sun. And here is the other one. This has been out already. And this is Double Delight. Also, Blush Rose. They look quite a bit alike. Um, some of these had more star-shaped flower petals when they first came out. But I, I'd be darned if I could tell the difference in that. So that's most of the scoop of the new trials. And we will know in September which one are going to be gold, silver, and bronze medal ones. Thank you for your attention. Right. If I can hear it. Yes. Are those begonias with the tags say you can plant them in sun? Oh, uh, yes. The, these begonias, she's asked, are these begonias, um, do the tags say you can plant in the sun? Well, online it says full to part sun. <laughs> Maybe in a container. I don't know. <laughs> are they getting fertilized here? 
Uh, yes, we put in, now, we try to do what a basic gardener would do, not what uh, a nursery that's a show place would do. We put in Osmocote equivalent, a long-acting uh, fertilizer in the spring. The containers, because containers wash out fertilizer easily, they get fertilized about once a month. But I don't know, where's Thomas? Here. Have you fertilized these since the Osmocote? Not since, no. No, we treat them like a regular lazy gardener. <laughs> Which is what I would be. I don't want to have to keep fertilizing all the time. Other questions? Have you put the torinia in a pot? Have what? Have you put the torinia in a pot? That's how no, I No, we have not put the torinia in a pot. That's another plant that would probably do better in a pot because it's going to get even water. It has to be in the shade. I've only planted it in the ground and I've never had good success. Perhaps others have. I don't know. Other comments, questions? Anyway, so at the end of the year, I make this giant Excel sometime in September when I can get to it, and I send it to the company, and uh, I record the conditions, like this year, incredibly hot and drought. This, why are all our plants looking really good? Because we have good volunteers, and they're good plants. <coughs> anyway, so I'll send that out, and I usually write up kind of a wordy document and send that out to people if you have questions. If you have somebody, your daughter-in-law's uh, christening of the baby is going to be in June, well, then certain plants are going to be good in June and others are going to be good later. So you can tell the month-by-month -month thing. So you could always email me at dermgood at gmail.com for the Excel when I get it done. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Wow. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Oh, yeah.